चमक तुझ से पाते हैं सब पाने वाले चमक तुझ से पाते हैं सब पाने वाले चमक तुझ से पाते हैं सब पाने वाले मेरा Honorable and respectable elders, brothers and sisters, lovable youngsters. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum My apologies for my slight lateness as I've just come from Telford near Birmingham during the day at the Markazi Jamia Masjid there. There was the Sayyiduna Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiyallahu ta'ala anhu conference. Nevertheless, we are here now. Today is module five out of eight, covering the noble and blessed prophetic life of Huzu Jani Jana Rasul Akram Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaikum Wasallam. Without even realizing, we have covered 53 blessed years of the life of Huzu Jani Jana Rasul Akram Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And if you remember from the first module, I said there are three parts. As an overview, there are three parts to the life of the Prophet ﷺ. The 40 years before the announcement of prophethood, the 13 years after the announcement of prophethood in shahr e al and the third period, the 10 years in al madinah al -Munabra. So, bihamdillahi ta'ala, we have covered two out of these three periods from the noble and blessed life of Huzu Jani Jana Rasul Akram Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Those who have been attending regularly, no doubt, will be fully aware in relation to the finer details that we've covered over the last four modules. There are nearly eight hours covering the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from different angles and perspectives. To the best of my ability, I make this sincere dua that Allah Almighty accepts our efforts. Say Ameen. And Allah Almighty rewards us for our sitting here and teaching and studying and learning about the life of Wuzu Jani Jana Rasuli Akram Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Last month we ended the discussion by touching upon the Hijrah, the migration from the city of his birth, al makkah al mukarramah to the city which was referred to as Yathrib. And then upon his arrival, this city became al madinah al munawwarah And we spoke about them three days and three nights that the Prophet wasallam and his best friend, the first man who accepted and announced Islam, or Baqaida Yari Ghar, Afbal al Bashar Ba'd al Anbiya, Sayyiduna Abu Bakr Siddiq, Radiyallahu Ta'ala Anhu, spent with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Thani Yathnaini Idhuma Fil Ghar, Idh Yaqulu Li Sahibihi, La Tahzan Inna Allaha Ma'ana. Allah Almighty mentions this in the Quran doing a dhikr of Sayyiduna Abu Bakr as-Siddiq in Surah at tawbah Surah number 9, verse number 40. And we also mention that when they eventually arrived in al madinah to munawwara Ahlul Madina, the Ansar, couldn't tell the difference between Huzu Jani Jana Rasul Akram sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Sayyiduna Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. Such were the effects of them three days and three nights in Ghari 
that the people of Medina couldn't tell the difference between the Mola and the Ghulam. And Sayyiduna Abu Bakr as Siddiq who had to take his blessed mantle and place it above the noble head of the Prophet and tell the people, Hada Rasulullah Hada Rasulullah that this is the messenger of Allah This is the messenger of Allah who you have been waiting for, who you have been yearning for, who you have been anticipating his arrival. And no doubt, this love demonstrated by Sayyiduna Abu Bakr Siddiq radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, we will not find this with any other individual in the whole Ummah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That relationship, that muhabba, that adab between Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq, you will not find this in any other individual. Albatta, ala Hazrat Azim Barakat Mujaddid Adeen Millat Mawlana Shah Ahmad Riza Khan Alihi Rahmat wa Ridwan they say that the greatest peer no doubt is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the greatest murid no doubt is Sayyiduna Abu Bakr Siddiq. The greatest peer, Murshid is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the greatest murid is who? Sayyiduna Abu Bakr Siddiq. Ta'ala anhu. Today, inshallah, we. <coughs> ah, just before we can come to today, a few incidences took place aside from these three days and three nights in Ghariffal. A few incidences took place on the way to Al Madinah to Malabara. One particular incident I want to share with you. There is the famous narration of Ummi Ma'bad or Baqaida Buraida Aslami. But the incident I want to share with you is that of Saraqa bin Malik radiyallahu ta'ala anhu. <coughs> Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi when they left the home of Ummi Ma'bad on the way to Al Madinah to Munawwara, they came across a famous and experienced horse rider of Makkah. Remember, a bounty had been set upon the Prophet and Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq that whoever brings them back, dead or alive, would receive the reward of 100 red camels. So everybody was frantically looking for the Prophet and Ya Rehgar Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq. One of these individuals was Saraka bin Malik. And he was upon his horse. And when he saw the Prophet وسلم, he began accelerating towards them. Eventually he reached the Prophet وسلم, with this intention to attack Nabi Salaatu Salaam. But his horse and he himself they fell to the ground. They fell to the ground. Against his will. This is ultimately a dua that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made that caused the horse to sink its knees into the ground. And it made Saraka bin Malik tremble in fear when he saw and witnessed this miracle. He pleaded to be saved and no doubt his plea was to the mercy of mankind. Huzu Jani Jana Rasuli Akram Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam took pity on him. And they made a second dua causing the horse to be released from the sand. Saraka bin Malik asked for a guarantee of safety from the Prophet Nabi Islam ordered the guy Amir bin Puhayla to write out this guarantee. And eventually Saraka bin Mali goes back to Makkah al Mukarramah and he says to the Quraysh Mushrikeen in Makkah 
that I've searched everywhere for him, but I couldn't find him. I couldn't find him. At this point, Saraka bin Malik had not accepted Islam. But he was greatly impressed by this mu'jizah of the Prophet and he was mesmerized by the awe and the majesty of the Wadduha Chera and Wallail Zulfa of Rasul Akram Al-Bata Nabi Islam said to him that, O Saraka, how shall you feel when you will be given the bangles of Kisra to wear? Just before the agreement was written out. Nabi Islam said to him, that how will you feel when you will be given the bangles of Kisra to wear? Kisra is the title of the king of Persia. And Saraka bin Malik on that occasion didn't respond. It was beyond his understanding. Later he accepted Islam on the occasion of Fatih Makkah. And after Nabi Islam Islam Rizahi Parta from this dunya, during the Dore Khilafat of Sayyidina Umar Farooq, which lasted for 10 years, Sayyidina Umar Farooq's Khilafat lasted for 10 years. The Muslims, the Sahaba, they conquered Persia and the bangles of Kisra were in front of Sayyidina Umar Farooq. And Sayyidina Umar Farooq calls Saraka bin Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And Sayyidina Umar Farooq says to Sayyidina Saraka that, O oh Saraka, praise Allah who has granted you the bangles of Kisra to wear. Thus fulfilling the prophecy and the message of Rasulullah yes. This Sahabi, Sayyidina Saraka bin Malik passed away in the year 24 AH after Hijrah during the Khilafat of Sayyidina Uthman Ghani. So this incident took place, this encounter with Saraka bin Malik uh, took place on the way to al Madinah al Munawwarah. When they arrived in al Madinah al Munawwarah, the splendor was such that women and children, all of the people of Medina, they were eager to meet the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Every day they would climb the rooftops of their homes to see where the Nabi Islam had arrived. And every day they would return home disappointed. Before the midday heat began to kick in, they returned home disappointed. One day they eventually saw that Three individuals were coming on two camels, were coming towards them or Baqaida when they saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they welcomed him, they welcomed him. And the place where they welcomed him, though I've not mentioned this in the notes in detail, but it is the second bullet point on page one here. I've put an overview of the first and the second year after Hijrah, which is what we're going to be looking at today in your notes on the top of page one. The second bullet point is that when Nabi Islam arrived at a place called Uba, a place called Uba, Nabi Islam here constructed the first purpose built masjid. The first ever masjid was constructed at this place called Uba. Masjid e Uba. Allah Almighty mentions this in the Quran, Surah at tawbah Surah number 9, verse number 108. I would uh, advise that you write the reference down. Uh, because Allah Almighty, verse 107, talks about Masjid al Dirar. Masjid al Dirar. The Masjid that the hypocrites built. And in the next verse, Allah Almighty talks about Masjid al Quba. Uh, Masjid al Quba, though not directly mentioned, but Mufassirun said that in this verse, Allah Almighty talks about Masjid al Quba. La masjidun usisa wa usisa ala taqwa min awwali yawmin ahaqqu an taquma fihi Allah Almighty talks about the masjid whose foundations had been laid upon righteousness upon taqwa yes yek lami guftagu hai I'm not going to go down that route but just by way of reference surah number 9 Surah at tawbah verse number 108, where Allah makes an indirect mentioning of masjid e So the first purpose-built masjid 
was constructed at Quba. Yes, Sahaba Karam took part in the construction of this masjid. Nabi Sallallahu himself also took part in the construction of Masjid Quba. And Abdullah ibn Rabaha, Sahabi Rasul Sallallahu Taala Wasallam, he created a passionate and eager atmosphere reciting couplets that aflaha ay yu'alidu al-masjidan wa yaqra'u al-qur'ana qa'iman wa qa'idan that successful is he who helps in building a masjid <coughs> Sahabi is saying this successful is he who helps in building a masjid recites the Qur'an while standing and sitting wala يَبِيتُ اللَّيْلَ عَنْهُ رَاقِدًا And successful is he who doesn't waste the night sleeping. So these were the couplets being recited by Abdullah ibn Rawaha radiyallahu ta'ala anhu. Yes? So initially a small um, construction of Masjid al was made. It took around 14 or 24 days. Yes? To complete. And we know that the one who reads two rakat nafal in masjid al today the prophet وسلم, because the sahaba they were missing makkah al mukarrama so in order to compensate this because in makkah al mukarrama they had the opportunity to do tawaf and they had the opportunity to perform umrah and do the annual hajj and those who had done hijrah remember this as well we'll come to this later that those who did hijrah are known as the muhajirun the migrants, they became uh, restless, that they were not able to fulfill their desire in performing the tawaf and completing umrah on a regular basis. So Nabi Islam gave them this basharat, that the one who reads two rakat nafal in masjid Quba, he will get the reward of an accepted umrah. Uh, he'll get the reward of an accepted umrah. And this wasn't something which was just relevant and restricted to the door of zamana of the Sahaba Ikram, even till today, al batta ila yawmil qiyama. Whoever goes to Masjid Quba and reads two rakat, nafal there, for every two units of prayer that individual reads, he or she will get the reward of an accepted Quba. Yes. And Nabi Rasulullah would make journey to Masjid Quba by a pedal, walking every Saturday after Fajr. Write this down. Every Saturday after Fajr, Nabi Rasulullah would make journey from Al Masjid al Nabawi Sharif to Masjid al Quba. And those of you who have been, and those of you who have made this journey by, by foot, walking, you know that it will take no more than uh, 30 minutes. And if you're a slow walker like me, carrying a bit of extra weight, 45 minutes, yes? And Alhamdulillah, every year we go. Uh, and recently, when we've been with the Sadat, uh, we would go and we'd take the youngsters with us as well every Saturday after Fajr, fulfilling this Sunnah. Fulfilling this Sunnah. Okay? So, this is Masjid al Quba. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam leave Quba Sharif on a Friday. On the way, they stop at a place to offer the Juma Salah. That place where they stopped to offer the Juma Salah, later a masjid was built there. That masjid is known as Masjid e Jum'ah. Not too far from Masjid e Quba. Eventually they arrived in central Al Madinatul Munawwara. And the two lines extending from Quba to Medina welcoming the Prophet. Alayna min thaniyyatil wada'i wajabat shukru alayna ma da'alillahi da'i They were reciting this pasida, they were playing the daf and this beautiful scene in al Madinatul Munawwara, the chosen one, Al Mustafa Wal Mujtaba has arrived. And Sayyidina Anas bin Malik says that before the Prophet وسلم, arrived, the city was the city of disease. And when he arrived in Madinatul Munawwara, this city became the city of cure and barakah and blessing. And but the day he arrived in Al Madinatul Munawwara, Tirmizi Sharif ki rivayat, Sayyidina Anas bin Malik was the day he arrived in Madinatul Munawwara, the city of Madina became illuminated. 
The city of uh, Medina to Munawwara became illuminated. And he says the day that Nabi Islam was coming further from this dunya, darkness once again engulfed the city of Medina. Sayyidina so, Barah bin Azib radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Jaleel Qadr Sahabi ya Rasul, he goes the scene, the scene, the atmosphere, the environment, when Nabi Islam arrived in Medina to Munawwara, this scene, this atmosphere, this environment, was never seen before, never has it been witnessed after as well. This was the arrival of the chosen one in the city of Al Madinah to Munawwara. And these Ahlul Madinah, these people of Medina, they openly welcomed Nabi Islam. Yes, we'll come to this later. They are referred to as the Ansar, the helpers. Yes. So they were happy, they were joyous, they were, uh, they were in, this, in this state of ecstasy that the Chosen One has come to their city, the city of al Madinah to Allah. Okay? <coughs> Nabi Islam is upon his camel from the youngsters. What is the camel of the Prophet Sallallahu called? Hmm? We did this last month, I think. I won't ask you. Ismail, right? Anyone starts with a Q, Jalla, not from the youngsters, from the elders, brothers or sisters. Is it Kiswa? Ah. Kiswa is one pronunciation, Kaswa is another. Ah. Ah. Bakaida Kaswa. Yes, if you didn't know it, write it down. Yes. I take it all Liverpool fans are celebrating huh? the last minute victory, hence why we've only got the United and Chelsea fans here today, huh? So look lively. Yes. So, Nabi Islam was upon the camel, Qaswa. Or Baqaida. Everyone was uh, taking the reins of Qaswa. And they all wanted to host the Prophet. Nabi Islam said to uh, those who are holding on to the reins of Qaswa, that leave the camel. Allah will direct it. Allah will direct the camel. And ultimately, where the camel was to settle, that's it. That's where they were going to build Al Masjid al Nabawi Sharif. Yes. And the camel settled upon, yes, the land which was owned by the two orphans. The two orphans. Yes. And Baqaida, the two orphans who owned this land, they were given a price for this land and their debt was settled and the individual who paid the price for this land was Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu Yes. Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala who paid the price for the land. That land upon which today Al Masjid al Nabi Sharif is upon. Yes. So those individuals who have issues with uh, Siddiq Akbar radiallahu ta'ala who hmm, you pray upon the land that he purchased. You pray upon the land that he purchased. Anyway, uh, the construction of Masjid al Nabi Sharif begins. And this took Kamopesh around seven months. As we can see, bottom of page one. Yes. During these seven months, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stayed at the house of a Jalil Qadr Sahabi. Sayyiduna Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiyallahu ta'ala. Sayyiduna Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiyallahu ta'ala. Okay. Because his house was the closest to the land where they were going to build al-Masjid al-Nabi Sharif. Okay. So, how blessed and fortunate Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiyallahu ta'ala. And this is Nabi Islam demonstrating equality and fairness. 
if you wanted, you could have stayed in the houses uh, or any of the houses of the chiefs of Medina, the chiefs of the Aws and Khazraj. But no, Nabi Islam gave this sharaf and honor to Sayyidina Abu Ayyub al Ansari radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And we see within our notes here that the level of adab, keyword here, the level of adab, respect, honor, reverence that Abu Ayyub al Ansari radiallahu ta'ala anhu showed to the Prophet وسلم, was unprecedented. A few examples are here in your notes. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sayyidina Abu Ayyub al Ansari's house was of two floors. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told Abu Ayyub al Ansari that he wanted to stay on the ground floor. People were coming to see them, dignitaries, high level people, people <coughs> consulting them on a daily basis. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't want to trouble Abu Ayyub al Ansari and his family. Sayyidina Abu, Abu Ayyub al Ansari, he wasn't comfortable with this. The Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam are below him and he is above them. He is above them. Yes. But Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam insisted Abu Ayyub al Ansari accepted. And because those houses weren't made from what our houses are made from today. Kache Makan. Kache Makan. Bakaid on one occasion, top of page two, a jug broke and water began to seep through the roof and the ceiling. Should I say, water began to spill through the ceiling, or uh, that water from the first floor went onto the ground floor. So Abu Ayyub al Ansari became worried and very quickly took the only blanket chadar that he had and quickly began to soak up the water. The only blanket he had. He began drying the floor. The next morning he insisted, third line, he insisted to the Prophet وسلم, to move upstairs. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he assured Abu Ayyub al Ansari that he was comfortable uh, on the ground floor. But Abu Ayyub al Ansari says that, Ya Rasulullah, Ya Habibullah, we cannot go upstairs until you do. Yes? So it was only then that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam swapped places. So this is one example of the great level of other respect and reverence and honor that Sayyidina Abu Ayyub al-Ansari who showed towards the Prophet How long did Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stay there? Good point, seven months. Another example of this is that when Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would be offered meals that were prepared by the family of Sayyidina Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, whatever leftover food there was, Sayyidina Abu Ayyub al-Ansari was search for the parts of the food which were touched by the Prophet Sallallahu Ishq you can't learn from the books. Adab you can't learn from the books. Ishq and Adab comes from the heart. Yes? Nobody told Abu Ayyub, Abu Ayyub al-Ansari to do this. Nowhere is it written in the Quran or Baqaida, nor did Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi say this. Lekin ye sahabi ka aqeeda. Hmm? What did I say last month? And this is the difference between a sahabi and a wahhabi. Huh? Adab. Adab. Huh? Adab is the foundation of our success. Adab to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And everything that has a nisbah to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yes. Adab towards his ashab. Adab towards his Ahlul Bayt, Adab towards his Awliya, Adab towards the city of Madinat al Munawwara, Adab towards everything that has a connection to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yes? So why did Sayyidina Abu Ayyub, uh, Abu Ayyub al Ansari do this? He wanted to take the blessings from the food of the Prophet. Tabarrukan. Yes? He wanted to take the blessings. And he wanted to attain the blessings. Yes? On one occasion, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was presented a dish containing onions and garlic. But he returned it untouched. Unable to see the Prophet Sallallahu imprints uh, on the food, Abu Ayyub Ansari went to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said, Ya Rasulullah, is it impermissible? This food, is it impermissible? Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, no. But I was not fond of its smell. 
onions, garlic. I was not fond of his smell, for I am a man who speaks to the angels. The Prophet ﷺ said this. So Abu Ayyub and Ansari, they could have asked. Now, Billy Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't tell him to say this. Lekin, ishq comes from the heart. Adab comes from the heart. He says, Ya Rasulullah, if you dislike this, then I also dislike this as well. Like Sayyidina Adas bin Malik. He goes, Kaddu Sharif, Pumki, yes, Pumki Mubarak. He goes, that I saw Nabi Rasulullah Islam eating Kaddu Sharif. From that day onwards, uh, as I saw the Prophet Sallallahu eating, I also would eat Kaddu Sharif as well. Uh, olives, these are prophetic fr uh, foods and fruits and vegetables that Nabi Rasulullah Islam would prefer. Milk, yes. So whatever the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would eat, Sahaba Ikram would follow. Sami'ana wa atwa'ana. Whatever Nabi Rasulullah Islam would do, how he would walk, like the famous narration, Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhumah. Yes. Was making a journey on a particular route that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself would take. He saw a tree and he bent down. He bent down. And then after going past that tree, he sat upright again on his horse. Those who were traveling with him, they said uh, that we saw you some, do something quite ajeeb today. That when you came to a particular tree, you didn't bend down on any other tree. But on this tree you bent down. Why? Majra kya hai? And Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Umar says that one day we were traveling with the Prophet sallallahu on this very same route. And when we came to this tree, Nabi Islam also bent down as well. And I just did what the Prophet sallallahu did. Iski anil ittiba. Uh, what's the verse? قُلْ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهُ وَيَخْفِلْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ So if you want to know how to live your life, then study the way that the Sahaba would live their lives in the ishq and adab of Rasul Akram sallallahu in the muhabbat and adab of Rasul Akram sallallahu and in the gulami and ittiba of Nabi sallallahu alayhi then you will be successful. Then you will be successful. Abu Ayyub al Ansari, we know today is resting in Istanbul. Those of you who are able to make this journey should make this journey. Allah give us all the tawfiq. When they arrived in Medina Sharif, very quickly, Maghrib kis waqat? 47. Oh Allah. Huh? So when they arrived in Medina Sharif, people were presenting gifts to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Umm Sulaim, the mother of Anas bin Malik, she didn't have much to her name. So she comes to the Prophet وسلم, and says, Ya Rasulullah, Ya Habibullah, I don't have much to my name, but I have my 10-year-old son, Anas bin Malik. Ya Rasulullah, I have my 10-year-old son, and I give him in your way. I give him in your khidmat. From this day forth, he will serve you. He will do your khidmat. He will take care of you, Ya Rasulullah. Nabi Rasulullah accepted this. And says, Anas bin Malik says, that khadam tu Rasulullah sallam. Ashra Sinina, he goes, I served Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi for 10 years. Throughout this duration of the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi in Madinah al Munawwara, Sayyidina Anas bin Malik was the Khatim of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Bukhari Sharif, Muslim Sharif. And he says, Fama qala li uffin qattu. He goes, during this period of 10 years, not once did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say, uff to me. Not once did he raise his voice against me. Not once did he say to me, why, did you, why didn't you do it like this? Or why did you do it like that? Not once did Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi reprimand me. Not once did Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi speak up against me. If this is how Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi was towards his khatim and ghulam, then just think how Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi was towards his dhurriyat and his khulam. And think how he would treat his azwaj and his pure wives, the ummahatul mu'mineen. Uh, Allah Akbar. This is the maqam of Rasul Akram sallallahu alayhi wa This is why Sayyidina Aisha says, مَا كَانَ أَحَدٌ أَحْسَنَ خُلُقًا مِنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ sallallahu alayhi wa sallam That nobody had more of an excellent character and conduct than Rasul Akram sallallahu alayhi wa sallam مَا دَعَاهُ أَحَدٌ مِنْ أَصْحَابِهِ That whoever from the Ashab would invite him, he wouldn't reject that invitation. وَلَا أَهْلِ بَيْتِهِ إِلَّا قَالَ لَبَّيْكَ and if somebody from his family would call him, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi wouldn't answer back. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi would say, Labbaik, I am present, how can I help? Today, we as husbands, huh? macho husbands, modern day, 24, uh, 21st century, 21st century husband, if our wife says, take the rubbish out, huh? 
ਥੋੜੀ ਜੀ ਇਸ ਤਰੀਕੇ ਨਾਲ ਚੀਨੀ ਸ਼ੂਗਰ ਜ਼ਿਆਦਾ ਚਾਹ ਵਿੱਚ ਗੁੱਸਾ ਥੋੜਾ ਜਿਹਾ ਲੂਣ ਆਂਡੀ ਵਿੱਚ ਜ਼ਿਆਦਾ ਗੁੱਸਾ ਹਾਂ ਗੁੱਸਾ ਜਲਾਲ ਨਬੀ ਸਤਾਤ ਉਸਲਾਮ ਉਹ ਮੈਂ ਦੇ ਓਨ ਬਲੈਸਿੰਗ ਨਾ ਅਲੈਨ ਸ਼ਰੀਫ ਹੈ ਨਬੀ ਸਤਾਤ ਉਸਲਾਮ ਉਹ ਟੇਕ ਆਊਟ ਦਾ ਰੋਬਿਸ਼ ਨਬੀ ਸਤਾਤ ਉਸਲਾਮ ਉਹ ਟੇਕ ਪਾਰਟ ਇਨ ਦਾ ਹਾਊਸ ਹੋਲਡ ਚੋਸ ਨਬੀ ਸਤਾਤ ਉਸਲਾਮ ਨੇਵਰ ਰੇਜ਼ਡ ਹਿਸ ਹੈਂਡ ਅਗੇਂਸਟ ਅ ਵੂਮਨ ਔਰ ਅ ਖਾਤਮ ਔਰ ਔਰ ਅ ਚਾਈਲ ਟੁਡੇ ਡੋਮੈਸਟਿਕ ਵਾਇਲੈਂਸ ਇਜ਼ ਔਨ ਦੀ ਇਨਕਰੀਸ abuse that our sisters face rape within their homes i know children are here forgive me for being explicit but these things have to be mentioned we are the followers of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam therefore in our ways and in our etiquette we should follow him not just in terms of lip service in terms of our actions in terms of our afan him so as i was saying we've got to the point of the sira by nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam have now entered into medina we said for 7 months in this first year remember nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam was 53 years old when he made this journey from makkah to mukarramah to madinah to munawwara so in that first year after hijra for 7 months they stayed in the house of its sahabi abu ayub al ansari and which sahabi became the khadim of nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam Anas bin Malik radiyallahu ta'ala. Yes. And what was his khidmat? Uh, his khidmat was such any of the instructions, any of the tasks that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam needed to, uh, to carry out. He instructed Sayyidina Anas bin Malik to carry out. Sayyidina Anas bin Malik would carry out. He would fetch the water uh, for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to make ablution with he would carry the na'lain sharifain of Rasul Akram sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yes, this was his khidmat. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave dua to him, uh, making dua that Allah places barakah in his age, in his family, and in his wealth. And from amongst the sahaba, the one who lived the longest is Sayyidina Anas bin Malik. The one who had the most children is Sayyidina Anas bin Malik. And he was blessed with an, an immense amount of wealth. And all of this was gained through the khidmat that he did for Rasul Akram sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yes. And I remember one of the very first lectures I did here at the mission a few years ago now. I shared with you a narration, a famous narration if I was to mention it you will remember. Where Sayyidina Anas bin Malik asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that Ya Rasulullah, Ya Habib Allah, will you intercede for me on the Day of Judgment? And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Ana fa'ilun, I will intercede for you. So then Sayyidina Anas bin Malik said, Ya Rasulullah, where will I find you on that day? And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, quoting the narration here, concisely mentioning it, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, that you'll find me at three different maqamat and places on the Day of Judgment. Yes, we did this uh, in the uh, end of time series as well, when we looked at the Day of Judgment. Or Baqaida and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, you'll find me at the Pul Surat. You'll find me at the Hawzi Qawsar. And you'll find me at the Mizan. Huh? So these three places Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will be upon huh? on the Day of Judgment. So this is the level of devotion and the great yearning that the Sahaba had for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They were not content and satisfied with just that company in the dunya. They knew asal baqa is the akhirah. So they wanted this assurance and guarantee from Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That Ya Rasulullah, will we be your companion on that day? Will you intercede for us? Aaj le unki pana, aaj madad maang unse. This is what the Sahaba Ikram's Aqeedah is. So Anas bin Malik is that Sahabi. Sahabi Rasul, Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam. Bottom of page 3 we find here a few Uh, narrations illustrating how Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would treat children like his peers and trusted them with certain secrets. We're living in a very difficult time where nurturing and bringing up our children is a bit of a challenge. And I say that lightly. We know that in the, in the schools they're going to be teaching this LGBT, they've already started, RSE subject. We know that in the schools uh, the system is such that they are polluting the minds and contaminating the hearts of our youth and creating this 
uh, culture amongst our youngsters where they are constantly questioning why. Uh, maybe not in primary school, but certainly in secondary school, in college, in universities. Yes, this mindset has been created amongst our youth. Uh, they always ask the question why. And this is problematic. For us as Muslims, it becomes problematic. Why? Because we, again going back to that point I was mentioning earlier, the bunyad of the deen is what? Adab. And part of adab is that you don't question why. If your father or mother asks you to do something, you don't ask why. If the deen requires something from you, you don't ask why. Suman said this is blind conformity or blindly following. But the reality is that this is where ittiba is. Let me give you an example, famous example. Yes. The Prophet would wear khufain, leather socks, mukassins. And we know the Nabi Islam would do masa of the mukassins, the leather socks, not on the bottom but on the top. Those of you who wear mukassins from the brothers, you will know this. Nabi Islam would do masa, and it's obviously within the Hanafi Mazhab that you do masa, masa of the mukassins on the top. Not the bottom. Sayyidina Ali Murtaza radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Shere Huda, Mulai Kaina, Mulai Kul, Babul Ilm, Darul Hikmah, the door to the, the house of Hikmah, yes? Sayyidina Ali Murtaza said that Akkal would di dictate, Akkal would dictate that you do masa of the mukassins from the bottom, not the top. That's what Akkal would dictate. Why? Because the dirt gathers on the bottom of the mukassins. But Sayyidina Ali Murtaza says that where Aqal ends, Ittiba or Ghulamiya Rasul begins. And we don't look at what our intellect says, rather we look at what Nabi Salatu Islam said and did. Huh? So this is a danger. This was what I'm going off into a different discussion, forgive me. But this is still relevant. The way Nabi Salatu Islam was towards children, he saw by Islam himself and the two narrations there. If you have children, become a child with them. Treat your children nicely and perfect their upbringing. Yes. In another narration, the Prophet said, Be kind to your children and nurture your children with good ethics and morals. So in order to combat what they're teaching in the schools, and in order to combat the culture which is being created, which no doubt has been in motion for a number of years now, we as parents need to invest time in our children. Yes. It's all well and good giving them the latest video game, computer game, Fortnite and FIFA and GTA. It's all well and good giving them the latest trainers, Nike, Air Max or whatever it is. huh? or the latest designer clothing and giving them pocket money and all these things. Yes. But this is how the minds of our children go away from the core and the essence. This is why I often mention the narration that Adibu awladakum. Nabi Sallallahu said, Nurture your children. Adibu awladakum ala thalafi khisali. Nurture your children in three things. Number one, the love of Rasulullah Number two, the love of the Ahlul Bayt. And number three, the Tilawat of the Quran. Yes. We have this responsibility as parents. We cannot leave the nurturing of our children to uh, the schools and to the internet or uh, the TV shows that they watch. Yes. Just put your child in front of the TV and that's it. You get on with whatever you need to get on with. The child's mind is no doubt being brainwashed. These cartoons that they watch, slowly, slowly they are desensorizing them. Yes. Slowly, slowly they are brainwashing our children. Allah protect our children from the evils and vices of society. There are two more things here in the first year after Hijrah that I want to touch upon. A lot is mentioned here in your notes. Uh, just before we come to them, two things. Masjid al Sharif is being constructed. The two orphans 
whose land the Prophet وسلم, uh, instructed Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq to pay for and purchase. Them two offers were called Sahar and Suhail, page 5 here. Sahar and Suhail or Baqaida. The building work started, the construction of the masjid started. And Nabi Nisratullah himself took part in the construction work. This land had some ruins, trees, and a few graves of the mushrikeen. So Nabi Nisratullah ordered for the trees to be cut down and for the graves to be dug up and for their contents to be removed. And then that area was clean. The walls were made using half baked bricks while uh, date tree trunks were used as pillars. Sadagi, simplicity. The branches of them, date tree trunks, they were used, fastened together and spread in order to make a roof for the masjid. And as I mentioned, Nabi Islam himself would participate in the construction of Masjid in Nabi Sharif. He would lift the bricks uh, with his own blessed hands and he would secure them in place and he would recite the following, encouraging the Sahaba that Allahumma la khayra illa khayrul akhira faghfiril ansara wal, mu wal, wal, mu wal, wal muhajira no? wal muhajira that oh Allah, the virtue, uh, the true virtue is in nothing but the akhira therefore forgive the ansar and forgive the muhajir Nabi Islam will make this dua different uh, Baqaida books of Sira might mention different things here but the construction of Masjid in Nabi Sharif its original dimensions were 64 meters in width by 54 meters in breadth yes and I don't think uh, that it is mentioned in your notes you can make a note of it yes. 64 by 54 and originally the Qibla was towards Baytul Muqaddas Al Masjid Al Aqsa later it was changed we're going to do that in a short while okay and at the same time whilst Masjid Al Nabi Sharif was being built there was a veranda that was made for the Ashab Al Sufa yes those companions who had little to their name very little in terms of possessions and belongings they would then live in this area known as the area of the Ashab al Sufa and they would uh, study and seek knowledge from the Prophet amongst them Sayyidina Bilal Habshi radiallahu ta'ala anhu Sayyidina Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu Sayyidina Abu Darda radiallahu ta'ala and so on and so forth yes so they call Masjid Saad Saad Madrasa Masjid Saad Saad University Huh? Or Am University ni the University of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. When Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wa wa who when he introduced himself he said Inna ma bu'ithu mu'alliman who Allah Almighty sent as a teacher. This was huh? the day to day life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in Al Madinah al Munawwara. The part of this khidma uh, or part of this mission of the Prophet Sallallahu and propagation of Islam was that he would spend time uh, teaching the Sahaba Ikram, educating the Sahaba Ikram, nurturing the Sahaba Ikram, doing the tarbiyat of the Sahaba Ikram. So where we have a masjid, Saad Saad, we need a madrasa as well. Yes. But sadly we find in the day and age that we live in, and yes I'm going to go off in another tangent, uh, we find in the day and age that we live in, that money is being spent on our masajids, but little investment is being made in our madarises. Would you agree upon this? And I speak generally here. Hundreds and thousands, if not millions, are being spent on uh, the decorations of the masjid, the mihrab of the masjid, uh, the minars of the masjid, the minarets of the masjid. Rightfully so. Uh, you should have a masjid which is hasin or jameel, beautiful and adorned, but we shouldn't get carried away. Yes? And if that uh, community or that committee or those people are investing tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions in some cases on the masjid 
then they have a duty and responsibility to spend a similar amount, if not at least half of that, on the madrasa, on the ta'leem that those children are receiving in that masjid as well, in that madrasa as well. We find that many markazi jamia masjids up and down the country uh, don't even have a proper syllabus in place. Teaching books written by the Obandis, Sunni idars. Yes. But we look at this, this is the Naraz Onos is Galpa. Yeah, people will pick a bone to a vessel. Nobody likes what I say anyway. Huh? So, Bakaida, if I say it, it's no skin of my nose. Yes? I won't name a shame, but big Sunni masjids and madarises teaching Diobandi books, yeah? Safar Academy books, or whatever it may be. Huh? So, we need to focus upon this. Invest in your children, invest in your madrasas, invest in ta'leem, and everything else will fall into. Place. Okay. At the same time, when Masjid in Abishri was being constructed, the Hujarat of Nabi Rasulullah were also being constructed as well. Hujarat is the Jama of Hujra. Hujra means uh, the chamber, the room of the Prophet Sallallahu Yes. So these were also being uh, constructed at the same time as well. So at this time, Nabi Rasulullah was only married to say the Sauda and say the Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. So no more than two were initially constructed, but as Nabi Islam married more Azwaj Mutahara, Ummahat al Mu'mineen, then more Hujarat were uh, added on to uh, the construction of the Masjid here. Simple Hujras of the Prophet Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam. Or Yesadagi and Dazalaw, these were those houses that even Jibrail himself wouldn't enter without permission. Simplicity, sadagi, uh, walls made from half-baked bricks, date tree branches as roofs, and just ten handspans long and seven handspans wide. al uh, it's mentioned that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi will stand and their blessed head will be touching the ceiling. That's the simplicity. <coughs> okay. Two more things here then in the first year after Hijrah before we quickly touch upon the Battle of Badr and conclude inshallah. So much can be mentioned, so much can be said. Here we have on page four, the pact of brotherhood between the Muhajirun and the Ansar. The pact of brotherhood, the brotherly ties. Nabi Salaam Islam through their prophetic wisdom established Ties between a muhajir and an ansari. Yes. So the singular here, muhajir, is the singular, and ansar. Ansari, singular, and the plural obviously ansar or muhajirun, as it's mentioned in your. Notes, yes. But uh, how do you do we know migrants or immigrants? And they were the residents of Mecca who moved to Medina to Munawwara. And the Ansar comes from the word Nasara Yansuru, Yani helpers. Nukta here. For those who understand, will understand that here Allah Almighty refers to them as the Ansar in the Quran. Surah Tawbah again. Allah refers to them as the Ansar in the Quran. Ansar meaning helpers. Today people have your ji. Other than Allah, you can't ask anyone's help. Ghairullah <laughs> say, yani, other than Allah, Ghairullah say, you cannot ask anything or anyone. For help, but these people with this uh, narrow-minded uh, ideology and mindset, they will say, "Don't even ask the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam." Then tell me, why were those people of Medina who openly, with open arms, welcomed Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Why were they and are referred to by Allah and His Rasul as the Ansar, the helpers? If asking help from anyone or anything other than Allah was wrong. Then why did Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam take help from the people of Medina? Take refuge with the people of Medina? 
and such help and refuge that those people of Medina, Sahaba Ikram, they are known as the Ansar. Are you understanding my point or is it too late in the day now? And as I know, look at the hair now. Next time somebody goes, go direct. One answer is, brother, it's not a PIA flight. Uh, those who know, know, I, you probably don't do PIA, do you? Uh, the Pakistani brothers and sisters will know. Yes? PIA direct, it's not a PIA flight, direct, direct. Alhamdulillah, we are those who have the aqeedah of tawassul and istighatha, wasila and wasta, be that through the prophets, be that through the awliya, be that through the sahaba, and be that ultimately through Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa this is just one nukta. Do we understand the point? Mm -hmm. So if taking help from someone or something other than Allah was so wrong, then why are the people of Medina called the helpers? Something to ponder upon. Yes? And the Ansar made up of two main tribes, Aus and Hazrat. Pranidur, or uh, tribes from the olden period. Yes? So Nabi Islam established this system of brotherhood, partnering, or partner, uh, partnering one Ansari with one Muhajir. And we've got examples of this here within your notes on page four. Yes. So this brotherhood was centered around the physical and spiritual assistance of the Muslims who had left behind all that which they had in Makkah and migrated to. Al Madina to Munawara. Basically, they were starting from scratch. Yes. And the limits that they went to were such that uh, Abdurrahman ibn Auf, one of the Ashara Mubashara, the ten who were given the glad tidings of Jannah in the dunya, Nabi Islam partnered him with Hazrat Sa'ad bin Rabi. Sa'ad bin Rabi Ansari. And Hazrat Sa'ad had two wives. This is the level and extent that they went to. He had two wives. He goes, I shall give talaq to the wife whom you choose to marry. Is haddak. Yes. And istri kinal. This bond of brotherhood was such that the Ansar, again, Hazrat Isad, he goes to Hazrat Abdurrahman bin Auf, that you tell me, you tell me, uh, Baqaida, whatever wealth I have, give the hukam. Whatever wealth I have, I will half this wealth with you and give you half of it. Yes. This is the level that they went uh, to. Or Sayyidina Abdul Rahman, you know, they want Istri Kinal. They didn't reciprocate it in a negative way. They just simply said, show me the uh, way to the marketplace. Show me the way to the marketplace. So uh, he was shown the way to the marketplace. And Hazrat Abdul Rahman bin Auf, he, Baqaida, became extremely rich. Extremely rich. So, so that from amongst from, 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 from amongst the Sahaba, the two companions who are there, uh, and one's known for their wealth, one has it, Usman Ghani, the other has it, Abdul Rahman bin Qur. And not just because they were wealthy, they would give that wealth in the way of Islam as well. Yeah, they would give that way, uh, wealth in the way of uh, Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq opened a fabric shop. This is different ways of business that they did. Hazrat Usman Ghani would sell dates when they arrived. Huh? Or isi tarike se Hazrat Umar Farooq opened business as well. But Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam established this system of brotherhood between the Ansar and the Muhajirun. And we know that every Muhajir was partnered with an Ansari. One Muhajir remained. He came later, for he was given the instruction to sleep in the bed of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. None other than Mulai Kainat, Mulai Kul. Mushkib Kusha Shere Huda Sayyidna Ali Murtaza Radi Allah Karanhu. So Sayyidna Ali didn't have a Ansari brother to be partnered with. So Nabi Islam, so Sayyidna Ali goes, Ya Rasulullah, Ya Habib Allah, who will you unite with me in brotherhood? And Nabi Islam said, Anta Akhi fi dunya wal akhira. Oh Ali, don't worry, you are my brother in the dunya, you are my brother in the akhira as well. So Sayyidina Ali Murtaza is partnered with uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Nabi Islam made dua for Medina as well. A few touching points here. The Muhajirun, they became homesick. Many of them began to fall ill. Hazrat Bilal Habshi, Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq. Yes. 
They were so sick that their bodies would begin to tremble. That's how ill and sick they became. Because of them missing their watan, the greenery of Makkatul Mukarramah. Uh, and they would recite poetry praising uh, Makkatul Mukarramah. So Nabi Salatu Salam made dua. Bukhari Sharif. Nabi Salatu Salam made dua that, Oh Allah, make Medina as beloved to us as Makkah. If not more. Uh, if not more. Free its climate of sickness. Before it was known as what? Yes, the city of disease, the city of England. Free its climate of sickness and grant blessings, baraka in trade and expel the sickness of it to the area of Juhfa. Yes. So Nabi Salaam made dua for shahr Madina, al Madina al Munawwara. Like this, in this first year after Hijrah, Hazrat Salman Farsi radiallahu ta'ala no accepted Islam. These are a few points which you can make note of. Similarly, Hazrat uh, Abdullah bin Salam radiallahu ta'ala who he uh, accepted Islam as well. There was an increase in the rakats of salah. Up until this point, all the faraid salah consisted of two rakats each. But it was during this first year after Hijrah that the number of rakats for Zohar, Asr and Isha were increased to four. Uh, as long as those who were reading were not travelers. The first child to be born in al Madinah al Munawwara is Sayyidina Abdullah bin Zubair Write it down. Sayyidina Abdullah bin Zubair, the first child to be born after Hijrah. His father, Sayyidina Zubair bin Awwam, who is also Ashura Mubashra, one of the ten who was given glad tidings of Jannah. And his mother, Sayyidina Asma bint Siddiq, the elder sister of Ummul Mu'minin, Sayyidina Aisha, and the daughter of Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq. Yes. So Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq's grandson, Abdullah bin Zubair, is the first child to be born in Madinah al One of the three famous Abdullahs, Abdullah ibn Abbas, Abdullah ibn Umar, Abdullah ibn Zubair. And as soon as he was born, he was promptly taken to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam placed a date in their blessed mouth, chewed this piece of date, took it out of their blessed mouth, with their blessed saliva, and placed it inside the mouth of Abdullah bin Zubair. So this Baqaida was the Tarbijat that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would do to the children of, and we were talking about this earlier, this is why we should take our children to elders when they are born. And we should encourage our elders, our grandparents, ulama righteous people, who fathers of the Quran, uh, to Kinal, do this practice. Okay? The last thing I'm going to touch upon in this first year after Hijrah, yes, is the introduction of the Adhan. The first Adhan. Page 7. Page 7. Are we following? So Adhan was introduced here. So as soon as uh, Masjid al Nabi Sharif was completed, there was no real way of calling the companions to the Salah. There was no medium that the people could be informed of regarding the time of the congregational Salah. So Nabi Salatu Islam consulted his Sahaba Ikaram. Uh, some suggested that a fire be lit. Others suggested that a trumpet be blown. These methods were not preferred because they were methods adopted by the kuffar, the disbelievers. So it was Sayyidina Umar who said that someone should go around Medina announcing the time of Salah. Nabi Salaam Salaam liked this idea, yes, and Sayyidina Bilal Habshi was chosen to be the first Mu'addin, the first caller to the prayer, yes, or Istri Kaseh. Sayyidina Bilal Habshi five times a day would call the Adhan. Yes. It was during this time. You know, so they initially called the uh, people to the prayer, As Salatu uh, Jama'atun. Okay. That the Salah is about to be offered. A Sahabi by the name of Abdullah bin Zaid Ansari had a dream. Abdullah bin Zaid Ansari had a dream. And in this dream, he was shown uh, the way in which the Adhan should be called according to the Sharia, yes, which is the present Adhan today. 
And this dream thereafter was also seen by the Prophet Sallallahu Sayyidina Umar Farooq, other Sahaba Ikram as well. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi accepted this as an order from Allah Almighty. Okay, so by way of a dream, the wording, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Ashadu Allah, Ilaha Illallah, Ila Akhir, the wording of the Adhan was introduced. Abdullah bin Zayd taught Sayyidina Bilal Habshi because he was Baqaida, uh, known for his loud voice. And also this was a sharat that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi bestowed upon Sayyidina Bilal Habshi that he ultimately was chosen to call the Adhan. Okay? So this uh, is just some of the things that took place in the first year after Hijrah. Okay? Very quickly, three things I want to touch upon. And I've got less than 10 minutes. Second year after Hijrah, there's an overview on the first page. Many things took place. For example, two pillars of Islam were made obligatory in the second year after Hijrah. Fasting and Zakat. Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha were also introduced in the second year after Hijrah. Nabi Islam, Islam now is into the 55th year of his noble and blessed life. Yes. Or Baqaida. Interestingly here, Eid al-Adha, 10th of Dhul-Hijjah, introduced in the second year after Hijrah. Hajj was made obligatory many years later. Yes. Al-Bata Nabi Islam himself performed Hajj in the ninth year after Hijrah. So for seven years, Kamupesh, the Sahaba Ikram determined the tenth of Dhul Hijjah upon the sighting of the moon. Which means there is no direct correlation between the day of Hajj and the day of Eid. Rather, the day of Eid, the tenth of Dhul Hijjah, is established upon the sighting of the moon. Within the books of Seed and the books of history, uh, there have been occasions where Ahlul Makkah have done Eid al Adha different to the day that Ahlul Madinah did Eid al Adha. There is no direct correlation because it was introduced the Eid al-Adha as well as Eid al-Fitr and Sadaqat al-Fitr and this was introduced in the second year after Hijrah. Hajj was made obligatory a lot later. Out of all of the pillars of Islam, five of them in total, Hajj was the last one to be made obligatory. Yes. Shahada being the first one, then Salah. Now we've just mentioned Saum and Zakat were then made obligatory the second year after Hijrah. And then Hajj a lot later, yes? A point here to note. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is how old now? G? 55. How many years have they been propagating the message of Islam, calling people to Islam? 15. 15 years, yes? For 15 years, now, after 15 years, three pillars, Amalan, in terms of action, shahada is obviously iqrarun bil lisan wa tasdiqun bil qal. The three pillars, amalan, salah, zakat, and song. Song in the month of Ramadan. Yes, three pillars were made obligatory after 15 years. After 15 years. So for 15 years, we need to ask the question what was Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi doing? You ask a lot of energy, but you don't have to do it. You don't have to do it. You do Bora Bistra Chaita Loka ki Basji is Trikina Befu Prani. And Choda so Salo Egin Ajayan Yamazani Pakyoya. Yamas for Namas for Namas for Alhamdulillah, we are not going to leave our Salah. A Salatu Mifta Hul Janda, as it's on the border. I just saw it after we read Maghrib. That a Salah is the key to paradise. A Salatu Mirad al Mu'min. Salah is the ascension of the believer. We are not going to leave our Salah. We are not going to abandon our Siyam. We are not going to stop giving Zakat. We will perform Hajj if we have the means. Lekin Iman is not in Salah. Iman is not in Siyam. Iman is not in Zakat or Hajj. Iman is in Mahabbat e Rasul Iman is in Mahabbat e Rasul. For 15 years, after 15 years, three pillars became fal. Chalo, let's just say salah. The first pillar, amalan to become fal, was on the night of Mi'raj, which is this year, uh, Tuesday night, 22. When is it? 27th of Rajab, one year before Hijrah. The gift of salah was given to the Prophet Initially, 50, 50 became five. 50 became five. So this is in the 12th year of prophethood. For 12 years, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi was inviting people towards Islam, not towards the practical actions of Islam, 
Nabi Salatu Wasallam was inviting people to Islam by rectifying their beliefs, rectifying their aqidah, telling them about Tawheed and the oneness of Allah, Risalat and Nabuwa, the Prophethood and the messengership of the Prophet Sallallahu It's only when they accepted this, they were ready to do Amal. Have you understanding what I'm saying? 15 years, three pillars have now become five. So today we think we can say what we want. I've made this point many times before, but it's relevant to the discussion. We can say what we want about the Prophet Sallallahu the Ashab and the Ahlul Bayt of Nabi Salaatu Islam. We can have this ghalasat in our aqidah, but we think our namaz is going to be our saving grace. That our siyam, zakat, the hajj is going to be what's going to uh, give us salvation on the day of Qiyamah. The reality is that these things are secondary. Muhabbat Rasul, Adab Mustafa is primary. Muhabbat Sahaba, Adab Sahaba is primary. Muhabbat Ahli Bayt, Adab Ahli Bayt is primary. If that person doesn't have Muhabbat Rasul, or that person doesn't have Adab Rasul, or Adab or Muhabbat Sahaba Ahli Bayt in his heart, then what benefit is Salah going to give him? And this uh, next thing that we're going to touch upon, the first thing in the second year after Hijrah, the changing of the direction of the Qibla epitomizes this. Yes? But come up page 17, 18 months, the Sahaba Ikram, the Prophet were facing where? What was the Qibla? Qibla over was Masjid Aqsa, Baytul Muqaddas. Yes? Masjid Aqsa. One day, <coughs> when today Masjid Qibla then stands, Nabi Islam was leading the Sahaba in the Zohar Salah. Which Salah? Zohar Salah. Two rakats, there have been increased in units now, two rakats were offered facing Al Masjid Al Aqsa. If your Makkah is that way now, Masjid Al Aqsa is that way. Going by uh, Shahid by putting the Musalla that way when I was reading Asr, right? So Masjid Al Aqsa is that way. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi is leading the Sahaba in the Salah. Bilal Tashbih wa Tamthil. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is leading the Sahaba in the Salah. And we see here the verses in bold in your notes, page 8. But indeed we see you turning towards the heavens. Qad nara taqalluba wajhika fis sama falanuwalli yanna ka qibla tan tarbaha. Barbar Nabi Salaatu Wasallam was looking towards the heavens. Barbar Nabi Salaatu Wasallam was looking towards the heavens. So Allah Almighty gives revelation. And Ya Rasulullah, Ya Habiballah, indeed we see that you, that you are turning your face towards the heavens. We give you this ikhtiyar, we give you this authority, that you change the direction of the Qibla to whatever your heart desires. Everyone is looking to please Allah, Allah is looking only to please his beloved Habib sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that's Allah. So Nabi Salaatu Wasallam changes Doran Salah. Nukta, Tawajjo. Doran Salah. Aaj Kalani, if you think about Nabi Salaatu Wasallam Adullah, in your Salah, your Salah is Baatim. And Batore Ishaar, I'm not going to go into all of that. Tell me, Nabi Salaatu Wasallam is leading the Sahaba, rows upon rows of the Sahaba in the Salah. Nabi Salaatu Wasallam, Doran Salah, change their direction from Masjid Al-Aqsa to Masjid Al-Haram. Sahaba now, this isn't about Amal, this is about Aqidah. Following and doing Ittiba of Nabi Salaatu Wasallam. Sahaba had a choice. Do they continue facing that way? Or do they follow Rasulullah And without delaying, Sahaba Ikram, row by row, they change their rukh, they change their direction from Al Masjid Al Aqsa to Al Masjid Al Haram. They do just as the Prophet did. Sallallahu ta'ala alayka wa sallam. Yes. And this incident is marked by a masjid being built there. Today we visit that masjid, it's called Masjid Al Qibla Dain. The Masjid of the two Qiblas. Yes. So this Vakya, this incident proves that the Sahaba Ikram, they rely upon who? Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They know that Allah Almighty has given this authority to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They didn't question. And this is the difference between Sahabi and 
Mahabhi. But Mahabhi will question, why is it this? Why is it that? Where's your dalil? Where's your proof? And the Sahabi Samitna wa Ata'na. And these incidences differentiated the true Sahaba who had Dorat the Iman in their hearts from those who were hypocrites and had Nifaq in their hearts. Yes. Okay. Now, we have reached our time and we have one last thing to discuss. The battle of Badr. The battle of Badr. So, Tahweel al-Qibla happens in the second year after Hijrah. Siyam and Zakat are made obligatory in the second year after Hijrah. Just before we come to uh, the uh, battle of Badr, yes, make a note of this as well, uh, that uh, in this second year after Hijrah, the noble and <coughs> sacred marriage between Batul Jannat Fatima to Zahra and Mawlai Kainat Sayyidina Ali Murtaza takes place as well. So I, I don't know if that's in the overview, is it? No, it's not. So write that down, please. Huh? Whose marriage takes place in this second year? Sayyidina Fatima Sayyiduna Ali. Yes, the daughter of the Prophet marries Sayyidina Ali Murtaza. One born in the house of Allah, the other born in the house of Rasulullah. Sayyidina Ali born in the house of Allah, in the Hatim of the Kaaba, uh, mentioned in the Mustadrak of Imam Hakim. And the other born in the house of Rasulullah. So their marriage takes place in the second year of the Hijrah. I'm going to make this quick and to the point and brief, yes? If you start going through the notes, we're going to be here all night. A couple of key points regarding the Battle of Badr. This is a bayan in itself. This is a bayan in itself. Just before we come to that, okay? The battles that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam took place, uh, took part in, sorry, not place, took part in, yes? Maybe, Karatakya Hafiz Suleiman said that he's going to take me out for a meal today. So I've kept the rosa all day, alhamdulillah. I'm just surviving on uh, liquids and uh, fluids. So we'll see where he takes us. Uh, uh, so I'm on my last legs now, yes? So if I do have a slip of the tongue, forgive me. So Nabi Rasulat Wasallam took uh, the battles that he took part in are of two types. Number one, I write this down. Ghazwa. Ghazawa. A ghazwa. This is that battle in which Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was present. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was present. That battle is known as a ghazwa. Like we have ghazwa i Badr, ghazwa i Uhud, ghazwa i Handak, ghazwa i Khaybar, the famous battles which we will discuss over the next couple of months, inshallah, Azza wa Jal, in the coming modules. Yes? So a ghazwa is where the fighting army in which the Prophet ﷺ was present. And when the Prophet is not present, but he gives instruction, that is known as a sariya. Okay. So the historians differ regarding the number of ghazwas in Mawahib al Dunya. 27 occurred. Uh, Alama Kastalani says 27 Ghazwas occurred. The Ghazwa is what? Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi himself was Mawjood and present. 27. Okay. And here, uh, differing opinions, one opinion 27, the other opinion Imam Bukhari gives. He narrates from a Sahabi by the name of Sayyidina Zaid bin Arqam. And he says the number of Ghazwas were 19. Yes. In terms of Sariyas, some say 47, some say 66. And one of the, there were a few Ghazwas that took place. Ghazwai Safwan, Ghazwai Hamza, 
Ghazwa Abwa. These were before the Ghazwa of Badat. Yes. And a few Sariyas took place before the Battle of Badat. The Sariya of Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas. The Sariya of Ubaidah ibn Harith. Baral, the Battle of Badr. Allah Akbar. You look at that. The clock has stopped. <laughs> I'm not joking, it's, it's, it's actually stopped. This is a sign. You see, I would have carried, don't think it's still 8.45, huh? And this is my, uh, what's it called? A chapan upon you. Baral, it's 8.52. That's it, we are going to read Isha, right? I will survive for a few more moments. Uh, so very, very quickly. Badr is a village approximately 80 miles from Medina. Yes? In it is a well. The owner of the well, his name is Badr. Hence why it's called Badr. Okay? Why did this battle take place? Very quickly, the reason for this battle. One reason which is given is that Amr bin Hadrami was killed or the Quraysh were angered by this and they wanted to seek revenge, one reason. The other reason that's mentioned most famously is Abu Sufyan was leading a caravan of around 30 to 40 people and one of the trade routes was past Medina to Munawwara and there was a lot of stock in this caravan and Nabi Salaatu Salaam Baqaida put a strategy in place where they wanted to divert the route of this caravan okay and they wanted to obstruct their trade route and they essentially wanted to capture the goods forcing them, I mean the Quraysh of, the, uh, the Quraysh of Makkah, the Mushrikeen of Makkah to sign a truce with the Muslims. This news, news reached Makkah Sharif that the caravan of Abu Sufyan is under attack. So without any hesitation, Abu Jahl, the Pharaoh of this Ummah and other chiefs of the Quraysh they use this as a means of going to war. And preparations were made on both sides. Nabi Islam took allegiance from the Ansar, Sayyidina Sa'd ibn Ubadah radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the leader of the Khazraj tribe of the Ansar. He said, Ya Rasulullah, Ya Habib Allah, we swear by Allah that indeed if you command us, we shall carry your command out to the best of our ability. Yes. So there was no hesitation from both parts. Like this. Yes. Sayyidina Miqdad bin Aswad, another of the leader of the Ansar, he said, Ya Rasulullah, Ya Habib Allah, we are not like Qomi Musa, like the people of Musa who said, let you and your Lord go and fight. We will surely fight and sacrifice, it, uh, sacrifice our lives to you, Ya Rasulullah. So, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi amassed an army of 305 Mujahidun, fighters. Where I say 313 is the famous number, right? We all say 313, Dras But what some people don't know is that eight of these, uh, from this number of 313, Eight of them didn't actually participate in the fighting. Something worth making a note of. Maybe something new for some of you. 313 number is, is commonly referred to and is referenced because 313 received the spoils of war. Mali Ghanimat. Like for example, from these eight, one of them who didn't participate in the fighting was Sayyidina Uthmani Ghani. He stayed in Medina Shri to look after his daughter, the daughter of the Prophet Sayyidina Ruqayya. Sayyidina Ruqayya passed away a few days after the Battle of Badr. Do you understand? So Sayyidina Uthman didn't participate in the battle, but he still, in the battle, he still got a, a share of the spoils of war. 
Therefore, he's still referred to as a Badri Sahabi. Have you understand it? Still referred to as a Badri Sahabi. So 313 of them are Ashab e Badr, the companions of Badr. But 305 of them actually took part in the fighting. Are we following? Okay. From amongst them, Jadeen Qadr Sahaba e Karam. All of them participate in this particular battle, the first of the battles. From this 305 number, 60 of them were from the Muhajirun. Write it down. 60 of them were from the Muhajirun. Who are the Muhajirun Ismail? It's gone. It's gone. All that glamour and stardom from the first two, three lectures. All that knowledge. Oh well. One day, inshallah, we'll get back. Muhajirun Ahu, somebody from the first line. Who do we call a Muhajir? Anyone? The Hijra. Ah, those who migrated. The migrants, yes? So how many of them participated in the Battle of Badr? 60. Therefore, the rest of them were Ansaris. Yes, Ansar, from the Ansar. I'm going to bypass a few details here. Eventually, they get to Badr Sharif. The night before, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi inspect the battlefield. The rest of the army are resting. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi spends the whole night in Ibadat. Spends the whole night making dua to Allah Almighty. And they inspect the battlefield. And the night before Abu Dawud Sharif, Muslim Sharif, the night before with a few devoted Sahaba, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi inspects the battlefield. And the night before he says, such and such a disbeliever will die and he will be here. Such and such a disbeliever will die and his body will be here. Such and such a disbeliever will die and his body will be here. This is the ilmul ghaib of Rasul Akram Sallallahu Alaihi That the night before the battle, he knew who would die from the disbelievers and where they would die. Nukta. If he knew who would die from the disbelievers and where they would die, don't you think he will know about the believers as well? And that's a lot. Yes, he was Sharif. And after the battle, when the, uh, the battlefield was inspected again, Sayyidina Umar says this, Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Mas'ud says this, that we found the words of the Prophet Sallallahu to be truthful. That wherever he said such and such a person would be, that is exactly where they were. They were not moved a single inch from that place. And that's allowed. Okay? The day of the battle, Friday, write this down. Friday, 17th Ramadan. So the battle took place in Ramadan. And this was the first Ramadan of the believers. Huh? Siam, fasting had just become obligatory. So Sahaba didn't say to the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, fasting has just become obligatory and you want us to go on jihad? I'm just saying for the sake of it. Huh? Nothing comes before the Namus of Rasul Akram Nothing comes before the Mahabba and other for Rasulullah Nothing comes before defending the deen, the religion of Islam. Yes. During the Battle of Handak, the Battle of the Trench, and we'll do this, if not next module, the module after. Sahaba Ikram did kaza of their salah just to defend the city of Madinah to Munawwara. Asanini ni bhaji, namaz, namaz, namaz. Yaar, namaz na chonne. Lekin saad, saad, we're not going to leave and abandon our aqeedah as well. Okay? On this day, which day? Friday, the 17th of? Or sif Ramadani, Jumeka din we. Sayyidul Ayyam. Yeah, Sahaba didn't do the, well, they did Salatul Khawf as they call it, uh, the, the prayer of fear. Oh, like a lot of uh, uh, masala. Like they didn't observe the Juma Salah. Do we understand? So they left the Juma Salah, they left the Siyam as well. Why? Just to defend the religion of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Nabi Salatul Islam is straightening the lines of the Mujahideen and with the Asar Mubarak, the blessed staff, they are straightening the roads. Sahaba Ikram are anxious, making noise, ready for the battle. 
There's one particular Sahabi by the name of Hazrat Sawad Ansari. Huh? It's in your notes as well. He's that Sahabi who was out of line. Nabi Islam took their staff, they blessed his stick, and they, uh, they pushed him back in line. He puts his uh, spear down and he says to the Prophet Sallallahu Ya Rasulullah, Ya Habibullah, you have hurt me, I want badla. I want compensation. Sahaba Ikram Aran, shocked. Uh, and what is he saying? But he says, I want badla. Just before the heat of the battle. <laughs> Nabi Islam, if he wanted, he could have given him a court martial like we would in the army today, yes? But this is Rahmatan lil Alameen, the mercy to all of the worlds. Nabi Islam put their stick, uh, Mubarak, the blessing, Asar Mubarak down, and they said to him, that come, take your badr. Sahabi says, Ya Rasulullah, Ya Habibullah, I wasn't wearing a shirt. You also remove your shirt as well. What is fair is fair. Sahaba Ikram, even more shocked. What's going on just before the heat of the battle? Nabi Islam didn't refuse his request. They lift their blessing, Kameez Mubarak. When this Sahabi, Sayyidina Sawad al Ansari, sees the flesh from the blessed stomach of Rasul Akram sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he runs towards Nabi Islam and he takes a hold of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he begins to kiss the blessed stomach of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sahaba, huh? they are now in a different kafiyat, different mahol. What is going on? Uh, many of them now are about to give their lives in the way of Islam. What's going on? So Nabi Islam didn't reprimand him. Nabi Islam didn't tell him off. Nabi Islam didn't say to him, why are you doing this? Nabi Islam allowed him to quench his thirst. And then Nabi Islam asked, kya hai? why did you do what it is that you did? And he says, Ya Rasulullah, Ya Habibullah, jawab mein sabak hai, that we are facing imminent death. We are about to give our lives for you and your religion. I wanted my last action on this earth to be that my lips touch your blessed stomach, Ya Rasulullah. That my lips kiss your blessed stomach, Ya Rasulullah. Nabi Islam said, it was this your niyat and intention? Ya Rasulullah, this was my niyat and intention. Nabi Islam said, if this was your intention, then glad tidings be upon you. Allah has made the fire of Jahannam haram upon you. This is ishq wa huh? This is what they want to take away from you and me. And sadly, we as Muslims, we've allowed the love of the dunya to come into our hearts. Two loves cannot exist in one heart. Dil hai wo dil jo teri yaad se mahmur raha. Sar hai wo sar jo tere kadmo pe kurban hua. Allah Hazrat said this. One heart means only one love. Allah Hazrat himself said what? If you were to take out my heart from its chest, you will see written on one side of my heart, La ilaha illallah. On the other side, you will see written Muhammad Rasulullah. Can we make that same claim? Can we make that same claim? It's not possible for two loves to exist in one heart. This is why Hazrat Dunun al Misri says, Live in the dunya, but don't let the dunya live in you. If you don't take anything from today's beyond, take this jumla. Live in the dunya. Dunya ke liye rehna hai na? Khana, peena, utna, bana, zimadaris, responsibilities, work, whatever. But don't let the dunya live in you. Meaning the hasad, lalaj, the greed, the wanting, the chasing of the dunya. Don't let that consume you. Because if it does, that's it, game over. Then it's just lip service. Uh, and I'm not just standing here saying that uh, that we are uh, somebody who epitomizes this. No, ma'adallah. We are in the same boat. Uh, this is a journey that we're on. Some days you'll have uh, good days. Other days will be more difficult. Your iman will fluctuate like this. But always have that love for Rasulullah This is what the Sahaba Ikram are teaching us. And this is what we learn from the seerah of Rasul Akram. Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. The battle takes place without going into the details of the battle. Yes, the two battalions clash. Allahu Akbar. Yes, during this battle, Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq is on one side and his son Abdul Rahman is on the other side. Abdul Rahman is not, he's not accepted Islam yet. Whose son? The son of Abu Bakr Siddiq. 
Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq is on the side of the companions. The companions fought against the army of 1,000 disbelievers. 3 to 1 ratio. Father is on the side of the companions. Son is on the side of the disbelievers. After the battle of Badr, a few years later, Abdul Rahman accepted Islam. And one day he comes to his father and says, that, Oh, my father Abu Jan, I had many opportunities during the battle of Badr to take my sword and to strike your, uh, your neck and to remove your head from its shoulders. But I didn't do so. Why? Because you are my father, I am your son. Jawab me sabak hai. Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq said, the beta, if you had come even once in front of me, I would not have hesitated. I would have taken my sword and removed your head from its shoulders. Why? Because loyalty and allegiance is with the Prophet So this is Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq sacrificing or willing to sacrifice his son for the religion. What sacrifices have we made? What sacrifices are we making? That's what we need to ask ourselves. The battle takes place, ultimately Allah Almighty grants victory to the Muslims and Ghaibana Madad, help from the unseen by way of the angels is given to the Sahaba Ikram. Initially 1,000 angels were sent down, then this was increased to 3,000, then finally 5,000 angels, including Jibreel and Mikail, came from the heavens in order to assist the Muslims and ultimately uh, Sahaba Ikram, they said, that we saw uh, that the heads of the disbelievers were being severed without nobody being next to them. We asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, said, Allah has sent the angels to help you. When you place your trust in Allah, Allah will send you help from the unseen. But when you place your trust in Ghairullah, yani those other than Allah in the sense that uh, disbelievers or you have this khawf or baqaida sumtri, uh, then no. Tawakkul ala Allah. Yes. I've just written on the board, 14 Sahaba gained their shahadat during the Battle of Badr. How many? 14. Uh, six from the Muhajirun, six from the Muhajirun, 
eight from the Ansar. Seventy disbelievers were killed, including Abu Jahl, Umayya bin Khalaf, and many of the chiefs of the mm, Quraysh, uh, Mushrikeen in Mecca. And seventy were captured. They became prisoners of war. After the battle, as I mentioned, uh, the battlefield was inspected, and those individuals that Nabi Islam had informed the Sahaba about who would die in the battle, they died and they didn't move a single inch from where Nabi Islam said that they would be. And the last thing I'll mention here, uh, these 70 were thrown into the pit of Badr. Nabi Islam began to speak to them that have you found the promise of your Lord to be true? Have you found the promise of your Lord to be true? Said Umar Farooq said, Ya Rasulullah, Ya Habiballah, you speak to them when they are dead. Nabi Islam said that they are perceived as dead. They hear just as clearly as you hear. The only difference is that they don't give a jawab. Huh? So if the mushrikeen in Makkah, 70 of them, including Pharaoh and Ummah, Abu Jahl, Nabi Islam is talking to them after they are killed, uh, then don't you think the believers are alive in their graves? And if the believers are alive in their graves, don't you think that the Anbiya Mursaleen are alive in their graves? Or the Aikamilin are alive in their graves? The Sahaba Ikram are alive in their graves? And if that is the case, don't you think Sayyidul Anbiya Ibn Mursaleen Huzu Jane Jana is alive in his grave? Tu zinda hai wallah. Tu zinda hai wallah. Mere chashmi haadam se chut jane wala. Yes? So this is this, the key uh, event that happens in uh, the second year after Hijrah. Abu Lahab also dies in the second year after Hijrah. Yes? And he dies a very horrible death. For days on end, his sons leave his body and the stench and the foul smell spreads through the city of Makkah. And the people of Makkah begin to curse his sons. So what do they do? They dig a ditch and they, with a huge pole, throw him into the ditch. Abu Lahab, uh, who Allah curses in the Quran, Tabbat yada Abi Lahabi Matar. Uncle of the Prophet lived as neighbor to the Prophet during Makkah al-Mukarrama. If there's no Iman in him, then there's no Rishta in him. Do we understand? So here, Abu Lahab dies a horrible death. Or Andaza Lao, these Khubasa, Wahhabi Hukumat of Saudi Arabia, they've destroyed and bulldozed all of the mazarat of Jannatul Baqi, Jannatul Ma'la, the gumbads and the, the domes. If you've seen the old pictures, you'll know what I'm talking about. The gumbad that they have left is the dome and the gumbad on the grave of Abu Lahab. You see where their loyalties lie. On the way to Hudaybiyah, I've seen with my own eyes. Yes, Sayyid Munawwar Shah Saab, Hafiz Allah Ta'ala, uh, they pointed out that is the grave of Abu Lahab. You see where these people's loyalties lie. Anyway, I think enough has been said. Uh, I have taken too much of your time. But this is the, uh, the danger that we run when we begin to discuss uh, matters related to uh, the Prophet Sallallahu and the Seerah. Sometimes we can't contain ourselves. Like in whatever has been said, I make dua Allah Almighty accepts it in his barga. Whatever wrong that I may have said, I ask Allah Almighty to forgive me. Uh, and Allah Almighty give us all the tawfiq to act upon the teachings and to implement the teachings of the Prophet Sallallahu into our lives. Allah Almighty bless us with the true love of Rasul Akram Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Sahaba Karam and the Ahlul Bayt Wa Thar and the Awliya Kamilin and the Ulama Salihin. Allah Tabarak Wa Taala bless our parents, our children, and the Muslim Ummah, the Muslims who are suffering around the world. Allah Almighty remove their suffering for them. Allah Almighty grant us unity upon the Aqidah of the Ahlul Sunnah Wal Jamaat. Allah Almighty bless the brothers and the sisters who have attended today's gathering. And Allah Almighty reward those who have facilitated this gathering, the intizami of this masjid, Hafiz Suleiman, Brother Shahid, Brother Hanif, uh, Maulana Farooq Sahib, Ashrafi, or Baqaida, all those who have facilitated this class, Allah give them ajr or jaza fiddarain. Allah Almighty keep us firm upon the deen and give us istiqamat upon our religion and give us sincerity in our actions. 
Allah Almighty keep us firm upon the Sirati Mustaqeem. Sami'na wa ta'na ghufranaka Rabbana wa ilayka al-Masir. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fi al-akhirati hasana ta'n waqina adhab al-nar. Allahum anfa'na bima allamtana wa allimna ma yanfa'una wa zidna ilma wa zidna hikma wa alhamdulillahi ala kulli hal wa sallallahu ta'ala ala habibihi Muhammadin wa alihi wa sahbihi.